Hello and welcome to Multivariable Calculus. This is part 12 and today we finally go to higher order derivatives. But first, of course, many many thanks to all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. Now before we go to the definition of higher order partial derivatives, let's discuss why we need them. Indeed, you might already know, it can help us finding local extrema of functions. Moreover, please recall, we have discussed this in our real analysis course for the one-dimensional case. Therefore, let's first look at a function from R into R. There, we already know, if we have enough differentiability, we have necessary conditions and sufficient conditions for finding local extrema. Therefore, maybe let's first recall the necessary condition we have for a differentiable function. So let's assume that the function f is differentiable at a given point x tilde. Moreover, now we also assume that at this point x tilde, we find a local extremum for f. More precisely, this means at this point x tilde, the function f has a local maximum or a local minimum. In other words, we can imagine that the graph locally looks like this or this. And now you know, for a differentiable function, it's necessary that the derivative at this point vanishes. Therefore, this is what we call the necessary condition for finding local extrema. However, you also know, just having the derivative at zero does not guarantee that we find the local extremum. In other words, it's not a sufficient condition. In fact, such a one we get when we include the second derivative. Now, with a simple formulation, we can just assume that the function f is two times differentiable everywhere. Then of course, we still need the necessary condition, we still need that the first derivative vanishes. And then, we have two cases we can consider with the second derivative at x tilde. So the first case would be, if the second derivative is less than zero, then we find a local maximum. In other words, both things here together now guarantee that we find a local extremum at x tilde. Moreover, we can even say it has to be a local maximum. Then of course the other one would be where we find a local minimum and there we need the second derivative to be positive. Okay, so this is what we know from the one dimensional case and now the natural question would be how can we translate this to the multivariable case. At the one hand, we already know the first derivative very well, so we can substitute it by the Jacobian matrix, by the gradient, or just by the differentiable as an abstract map. Or to put it simply, a necessary condition should be that the gradient vanishes at the given point. This is not so hard and we will discuss this in more detail in the next video. However, now for the sufficient criterion where we need the second derivative, this translation is not clear at all simply because we don't know yet what the second derivative should be for a multivariable function f. Therefore, in order to get closer to this generalization, let's start with the simplest case. This means, as for the first derivative, let's first start with the partial derivatives. This is simple because essentially the partial derivatives are just one-dimensional derivatives. However, now as we will see, we will have a lot of them. Okay, so the assumption is that we have a function f from rn into r, which should be partially differentiable everywhere. So please recall this term we have already discussed. It means that the partial derivatives of f with respect to all components exist at all points. So in other words, df dxi defines a new function. And this works no matter which index i we choose between 1 and n. Then, of course, for this new function here, defined on Rn, we can look at partial derivatives again. Therefore, let's fix the point x tilde again and then let's calculate the first partial derivative. More precisely, let's consider the one with respect to x1. And maybe the concrete function we take is df dx2. And as always, the point where we calculate the partial derivative comes afterwards. Okay, and now you know by definition, we have to calculate the difference quotient and then take the limit. So you see, it looks like as we have introduced the partial derivative in part 4, but now with another function, namely the partial derivative with respect to x2. Therefore, if this limit exists, we would call df dx2 partially differentiable with respect to x1. 
And then of course, this would be a second partial derivative for f. And for this reason, if the limit exists, we would introduce a new notation for this second partial derivative. Namely, we would write curve d to the power 2 of f. And in the denominator, we have dx2 on the right hand side and dx1 on the left hand side. Therefore, you see, the order should be the same as we have it here. Okay, there you see, this was just an example for the variable x1 and the variable x2. However, of course, you shouldn't have any problems generalizing this to all indices. Maybe the only thing I have to tell you here is that if we use the same index, then we have another special notation for it. Namely, we shorten the denominator as well and write dx1 squared. Then, in the same sense, we have the same notation for the variable x2, x3 and so on. Now, the important thing is, all of these partial derivatives are called the second order partial derivatives of f at the point x tilde. There, the term second order tells us that we have the partial derivative of a partial derivative. Now, by knowing this, you shouldn't have any problems going to even higher order partial derivatives. Indeed, this is what we will need when we talk about Taylor's theorem in the multivariable setting. Nevertheless, here we first focus on the second order partial derivatives. Now, one thing I can tell you immediately is that in general, this order here matters. So it's definitely possible that if you change the order of the partial derivatives here, you get a completely different result. However, the good thing is that in a lot of applications, in a lot of examples, the order does indeed not matter. Indeed, this is an important theorem we will discuss in another video. However, now in this video, we first look at an example. So let's say we take a function from r2 into r, given by f of x1, x2 is equal to the sine of x1 times x2. And then let's first calculate the first order partial derivatives. And maybe here, to keep it simple, let's omit the tilde for the point x we put in. Because then we could use the same variables as here. So by calculating here, we first get the inner derivative x2 times the cosine of x1 times x2. So the simple one-dimensional chain rule. And of course, by symmetry, we get a similar result for the partial derivative with respect to x2. There, only the inner derivative should be different, and here it's x1 instead of x2. Okay, with this we have new functions, and now we can form the partial derivatives of them. Hence, we already know, in summary, we will get four second order partial derivatives of f. So let's first start with the second order derivative with respect to x1 and x1. This means we differentiate this function here with respect to the variable x1 again. Hence we get the inner derivative x2 again, so we have it squared. And the outer derivative is simply minus sine, so let's put the minus sign here. Okay, then I would say in the same sense we can form the second order partial derivative with respect to x2 and x2. Because there it's a similar calculation again. More precisely, it's minus x1 squared times the sine of x1 times x2. So you see, it's not so complicated, therefore I would say we go to the mixed second order partial derivatives. So first, let's start here with the left hand side, where we take this function here and form the derivative with respect to x2. And there you should see, we need the product rule now. Therefore, here for the first part, we find the cosine again. And for the second part, we have minus sine again, but now the inner derivative is simply x1. Therefore now, together with the x2 from before, we have x1 times x2 in front. Okay, there you see, this is our result here for this mixed second order partial derivative. And now the question should be, what happens when we do it in the other order? More precisely, this means now we take this function here and form the partial derivative with respect to x1. Hence, you see, the product rule comes in as well. And indeed, the first term is again the cosine of x1 times x2. Then, for the second term, we get minus sine again, and for the inner derivative, x2 in front. In other words, this here is our result. And of course, we immediately notice it's the same as we had before. In other words, for this function here, the order of the mixed second order partial derivatives did not matter. 
In fact, this is a result from a famous theorem, which is known under a lot of different names. Therefore, I would say this should be the topic of the next video. Hence, let's meet there and have a nice day. Bye.